fiveanddimeeastin.com. They have their website officially up. You can shop most of their stuff online. They also uh, they also have fucked. They have fucked in the store. I think they're the only one allowed to sell fucked out of their store. Uh, it's 484-544-4719. That's at Five and Dime Easton on social media. These guys are great. I mean, they're killing it. It's the best skate shop, in my opinion, in the area. They have a lot of cool stuff there. Both the owners are rad. I stop in when I can. Uh, they're open Monday through Friday. Friday, 11 to 7, Saturday, 10 to 7, and Sunday, 11 to 5. There is someone always there to help you out with your needs. You can check their inventory off the website. You can check out some videos they got on there, and they're doing some cool things. Their social media is awesome. They support a lot of local skaters in the area, and they're growing. I'm excited to be a part of them growing. I'm excited to help them out. They're helping me out. It's a good relationship, and I push Five and Dime Easton because they're the best skate shop in the area. Check them out. B. TG Blasting, my man, Pat Cunningham, offering you pressure washing, disinfecting, acid washing, and rust removal. It is a high pressure washing business, bringing your stuff back to glory. He does anything from houses all the way to having him come into the studio. He comes down to the studio on a schedule and he disinfects the studio and we are certifiably clean and you, it just covers all the bases. So with the things that are going on now, you're going to be you're going to need somebody like this. He's got a sticker out front. I am certifiably clean down here. He also offers free estimates on all your needs. He can do corporate and at home. You can reach him at 484-241-1711 and btgblasting at gmail.com. He just started this business and it is taking off. I'm super excited for him and I'm super excited that he's a sponsor of the show. And you can check out BTG Blasting on social media for all of your presser washing, disinfecting, acid wash, and rust removal needs. It's high pressure washing, bringing your stuff back to glory. He offers many things and you need to check him out. Eric K. Dowdle, defense attorney. We had him on the show and what crazy stories this guy's had. He's helped a ton of people over the years and uh, if you're looking for help he is your guy you can contact them at 610-882-3000 and it's ekdefense.com uh, do you have a pending court case? Do you have a court appearance and need a defense lawyer? Do you need proper representation? Felony misdemeanor, drug offense, assault, homicide, DUI, traffic violation, appeals. Reach out to Eric. Check out the podcast we did with him as well. It has his whole whole story on there. If you need help, Eric is here to help you. He sponsors the show. We appreciate it. He's going to be doing a monthly thing with us. Eric will be a part of the family now. Thank you for sponsoring. 163, 164. You ready on the switch? Sure. I'm so excited. There's so many weird things here. Uh, Welcome to Never Again Radio, man. Thank you. We've been trying to do this for probably two to three years. I think we were even just audio. I had reached out to him on Instagram. You still had everything going on in New York City, and... I don't even know how I found out about it. I, I think I stumbled upon the page or something, and then I messaged you, and you're like, I live in Easton. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is going to be super easy. And then I think it was in a transition where we didn't have a studio, and you know, one of those, uh, one of those a couple months. Times, a couple of times, yeah. <laughs> so then actually, I always go back to people if it kind of went dead, and especially now because I'm like, hey, I'm glad we didn't do it back then because now it's full video. We wouldn't have been able to show off the pieces you have. Uh, you came down to the studio. I talked. We talked for a couple hours, and I am so excited to do this podcast. Uh, Obscure Antiques on Instagram. Yep. Um, why don't we just get right into how the hell did you get into doing any of this? Uh, that's kind of a that's a big. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? Um, we got plenty of time, so I'll kind of condense it a bit. Um, I've always been interested in in oddball stuff. I mean, I started off collecting photography and cameras and things like that. And then I started buying stuff to sell things to offset my collecting. And it got to the point where I kept finding kind of oddball stuff here and there. And um, I'd been working as a photographer. And um, for this antique shop, they wanted me to photograph something. It was this bench. It was gigantic. Uh, couldn't do it in the store, so I brought it around the corner, and um, I photographed it and everything, and I'm waiting for uh, the owner to come back to help me with it, and this couple comes out of their apartment with a, a taxidermy deer head and a bobcat, and they just play up, they pop it on the uh, garbage can, and they kind of like posed it there, and they're looking at it, and they start walking away, and I'm like, um, excuse me, are you throwing that away? 
And like, yeah, we're getting rid of it. I'm like, well, is it like buggy or something? Like, what's wrong with it? They said, well, we're changing our style. I'm like, mine. So, <laughs> and so then I started, um, I'm looking at, it's like, is a sneaking bobcat, kind of like a funny pose and, and just this doe head. And um, I'm, so I'm sitting there with like the, the you know, it's just, I just put down the, on the ground uh, waiting for the person to help me with the bench. And like dogs would come around the corner and like freeze. This is New York City. And, like dogs would freeze and look at it thinking it was real. And I'm like, this is really kind of bizarre. So then I decided to take photos of the thing. And um, that got kind of weird. I was in D.C. with them and like Boy Scouts were all kind of swarming at one point and and petting it and stuff. And then like <laughs> this Japanese family came over and wanted to take a picture with it. It was the strangest thing. Anyway, so I started buying more and more of it. Like, I'm like oh, I, this taxidermy is kind of weird. So I started buying some more of that. I was buying photos. I'd find like old circus and sideshow photos, um, postmortem photos, you know, death memorial stuff. It got to the point where I had so much stuff. I'm like, what do I do with this? And a friend of mine had a shop in New York. It's got him Adrian Gilbo, who's now passed away. And I started selling stuff to him. And um, he had a shop. I started hanging out at the shop and selling things and buying stuff from him. And he went through sort of a difficult personal thing and asked if I want to join as a partner. Um, and then my other business partner, Evan, uh, in the shop also, same kind of thing. We used to hang out from there. She also joined as a partner. Then all three of us had the shop. Back then, it was called Wandering Dragon. It was his uh, his shop. And then at one point, he left to go to Brooklyn. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to go back to a normal job at this point. I'd been in the photo world, working in stock photography and as an editor and as a researcher and as a, um, you know, all this kind of stuff, working in the archives. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll just try to do the antique thing full time. And she used to have some odd jobs, too. And I'm like, well, sure, let's do this. And so then started Obscura. Uh, this was back in the late 90s or so. We incorporated that shop in uh, 2001. Um, oddly enough, actually, our paper got our paperwork was lost in 9/11. Um, our, our lawyer, his offices were there, so we filled out paperwork was gone. We had to refile, so we incorporated uh, October 30th, 2001, and um, had that shop for many, many years. Uh, I closed the shop about a year ago, um, right before the whole COVID thing hit, and um, our, our lease was up, and it was very, very expensive, and uh, to run a small shop in New York City. Uh, the other thing is the business has changed dramatically. Um, you know, we had this that TV show called Oddities, which kind of really helped this stuff. Um, it's always been around. I mean, we didn't invent the Cabinet of Curiosity or anything like that, but it's become much more uh, popular. And so um, the business changes. Oddity shops all over the place that pop up. Uh, and it got to the point where I'm like, well, we're spending so much to do this sh this shop in New York. So uh, closed about a year ago and went online and I was doing some events, although those are on hold right now. But um, so, yeah, well, going back to your original question. So, yeah, just started collecting stuff and kind of just grew. The more I saw, the more I wanted. And then, you know, try to somewhat make it not so diverse, although it is kind of still pretty. Yeah, diverse. <clears throat> there's so much to pick through there. So my quick question is, how do you price something like this? That is an excellent question. Um, Like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you like? Well, this Ouija board is more than the other. I, I don't know how you would like the. I this Ouija board here is actually my earliest one. This is about 1890, this board, which is uh, Ouija was patented in 1891. It was technically invented uh, in 1890. Um, weird. Kind of, they existed before that, but not as the Ouija. There's something called the witch board and there's a uh, earlier boards and uh, writing planchettes, which uh, have like a pencil and that kind of thing. Um but as far as pricing the stuff, you know, it's it's some of it does sell online, so you kind of see comparable prices, and uh, sometimes you just kind of like I think I feel this is worth whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you ask the spirits, and uh, my you know. rent is <laughs> it's worth. <laughs> if we're a really good piece, I don't want to sell it. I'm like that's a little more expensive because I don't want to sell that. But um, you know, other stuff. It's after a while, you know, after seeing certain enough of of stuff, you kind of get a rough you a know, feel for yeah what what's the worth of something. Um, there's so much to come through there, especially the fact that you just brushed over the f that you did a TV show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're my favorite guests when they're like, ah, oh, we just did a TV show. Yeah, we did a TV I'm show. like, all right, I want to dive back through. <laughs> now, um, you got the taxidermy stuff and you start the business uh, in New York. Um, is this when you were in the village? Yeah. Yeah. This is what's crazy is I came down and I've been to that store because my friends have told me about that because you had other stuff in there besides antiques and stuff like mm -hmm. that, didn't you? You know, there was like kind of like punk rock stuff there, and uh, like what what was kind of the feel of the store? It, it was mostly in 
Keeg stuff. And we actually had only one shop at a time, but we actually had three different shops. We had moved twice. And it was usually this kind of stuff. You know, people think, oh, it's oddities. I'm an antique dealer. I'm not necessarily an oddity, an oddity dealer. And even though we're known for this kind of stuff, we do have other stuff too. You know, I like quirky stuff and I like oddball stuff. You know, the, the Mexican... Um, Mexican velvet paintings we yes, have discussed. And, we will get into velvet and paintings. And all different kinds of stuff, too. But it's always been kind of a quirky antique, you know, yeah. the weirder end of antiques for the most part. Now, was there multiple people um, going out and scouring after this stuff? Or were primarily stuff? Like, were your partners also into this field? So it was like a collective group buying lots? Or, like, how did you guys get enough pieces to be selling in there? It's a lot of running around. And it still is. It's it's auctions and estate yeah, that, sales. That's got to be fun, shows. though. It can be. I yeah. mean, often you have to wake up super at the you know the crack of dawn. You're up, you know, it's dark out. You got to drive in the middle of friggin' nowhere, and you know, with flashlights as people are taking stuff off of trucks and fighting with you know other people who are also there early to get stuff. And it, it's it, it's at the point now though that I've been doing this so long, and I know a lot of people, and a lot of it's networking. Yeah. So often people are like, oh hey dude, I found this really disgusting thing or this creepy thing. I thought of you, <laughs> which <laughs> which those are the best friends. Yeah. Those are the best friends. People, I saw the weirdest <laughs> thing. I thought of you, but don't get insulted. I'm like, weird isn't a bad word to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um. So I do have people who will call me up all the time with stuff. You know, other dealers. Um. Like I have a deal, and also have, I, it's not networking too. Like I have a friend who does like mid-century modern furniture, which I know a little bit about, but I don't sell it. So I see it, I'll tell him, and then he'll call me or text me like, "Hey, dude, I'm looking at a skeleton. I'm looking at a a Ouija. I'm looking at some weird crap that you might like." So it's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on too. When you first started buying stuff up, and you were saying how like uh, people were so drawn to that piece, um, were you? Um, like being drawn to the fact of like, oh, like, you know what I mean? Like, was it something that you got from people being so interested in it being so odd that that was the appeal? Or were you actually like, I, I know you're into all this stuff, but is there also like, like how we were when you first were showing it? Like, there's got to be a feeling when you're presenting a human head to somebody, the reactions you get. I mean, was it kind of like that was also a draw to wanting to get more of the stuff? Yes and no. I mean, ultimately, I do this for me, you know, yeah. I enjoy it. Yeah. And I've always been kind of that, you know, I don't know, it's a middle child thing or I've always been kind of the weird one in the family. And um, to me, it's sort of like um, it's sort of like art, you know, like a lot of the stuff has this sort of like attraction repulsion thing. You know, sometimes it's like like a car accident. No one wants to be in a car accident, but everyone kind of stops to take a look at it. And it's this sort of like attraction repulsion friction kind of thing that yeah. it's like, what is this? It's like. The stuff should you have all these questions, and then after you ask them, you have even more questions. Yeah, and it's stuff like that. It's it's curious. It's like why is this, and where is this from, and who made this, and where's this been, and you know all these, all these things that that these items kind of create in your in your in your head, and it's just like it's it's uh, something that's wonderful. It's it's a thing of wonder. You look at you like wow, like. I don't know where to begin <laughs> with stuff. What was it like for you to then turn that into a job? It, it's unusual because for many years uh, we had the shop and it was, you know, we didn't always have like a phone wasn't always on and it was kind of a sleepy kind of thing. I mean, we always had customers and locals and regulars or irregulars or whatever they're called. And um, once the show started um, and they found us, by the way, like, yeah, let's get into how the show started. Uh, we must have got on some list because one day it started. We started getting calls randomly from um, production companies, probably about a good dozen or so over the course of maybe six months. People kept calling, oh, I'm from this so-and-so company. And Do you think someone signed you up for something or like? I have no idea. Yeah. How I mean, we'd been around and people had known about us. We were kind of like everyone's favorite secret, though. Um, and we have some, some very big clients, some very well-known clients and, um, you know, they'd get upset when they found that other people knew about us. Cause, Cause like kind of like word of mouth, you know, a lot of word of mouth. We never really advertised, but we had been in New York city since, you know, the, the, the wandering dragon store was since like the mid 1990s, early 1990s in the East village when it was still pretty sketchy down there. Um, now it's all gentrified, but so we've been around for a long time. It's always been, oh yeah, that weird shop and the hours were all weird. And it was, people would be like, I remember kind of seeing the shop. It almost had a mythical quality to it. And like, we'd be up, like we wouldn't open up sometimes till the afternoon and be 
up and open all night long. And it was like a, almost like a party going on. In there. Yeah. It was what, like a, a what a cool time, though, because I remember being in high school and my friends would go into New York City and then they'd come back and they'd tell tales. It wasn't like now yeah. where everything's connected and you're like, oh, OK, I can follow Obscure Antiques and this is what they do. Like back then, it's like the older kids would come and be like, you guys went to New York City last night? They'd be like, yeah, we went here. And it was like so, I mean, that would be cool to be a part of a shop that's actually got buzz in New York City. It had a mythical quality yeah. about it. I mean, like I said, the phone, like the guy, Adrian, running it, like he was the most organized person. So like sometimes he was like, I'm not paying that phone bill. Screw them. So we wouldn't have a phone for months <laughs> on end. And um, it got really weird, even weirder than that. And, uh, and anyway, so we opened at like, you know, two, three, four, five in the afternoon to open up. And he lived in the back for a while. So we'd literally be open to like three, four or five in the morning. And there'd be like music playing all the like 1920s and 30s hot jazz and people drinking and smoking and people would kind of yes, come and go. Yes. And it was like this like strange party. And people so awesome. would come by and be like, oh, my God, I was here months ago. And then later I was like, did I imagine that? Because I couldn't remember what street you were on. I went back. I couldn't find it. And it's like it's like Skull Island that occasionally the mist will part. You'll see it. And then other times you will never find it again. No, it's, and, like, it's like New Orleans. We went to New Orleans and drank a lot. We yeah. figure out where the hell we were. The it it had that quality. And it was, again, the yep. East Village. And you're like, I remember their skulls. And <laughs> that's the thing. It'd be like East Village of like the 80s and late the yep. 90s. And, you know, it, it, it was it was kind of weird back then. And yeah. the this, the block had, had the Russian bathhouse on it and like two or three drug fronts back then. It was like it was not the most popular. Well, it was kind of popular block, but not that popular. Yeah, you know, it wasn't not in a way you wanted. <laughs> exactly. To be. So it was really strange. And like I said, people would come and go. with just random people. We didn't know. Be, you know, and sometimes they'd buy things or you know, like I remember one time these people came by and this one's like, oh my god, I want to try on this Victorian dress and literally just tear her clothes right off and put it on. And everyone's like, what? What's going on here? Like it was just. <laughs> and meanwhile, the people are smoking and there's music and sometimes people would be dancing. It was the strangest thing. It was magical. Anyway, so. um fast forward to about the thing so we started you know but it was kind of like a sleepy time like a little niche kind of small thing anyway so production companies one day start calling this is after adrian left went to brooklyn to start his, to keep his shop out there now were you and, there daily like you were going in like a, a job like nine to five like once i mean I, I know the hours are all fucked up but i mean are you there like this is your permanent you're like you're there you're a part of the shop you're there every mm -hmm. day you're coming in you're you're wheeling and dealing like you're you're you know you're there in the very beginning i was actually still working at that photo place so i was doing yeah. sort of like part-time and then once um i left there or was let go from there. Um, they got bought by a larger company and they got rid of that, like half the place. Anyway, so I'm like, oh, well, I'll try the antique thing for a while until I get a, do a different job. Yeah. And it was a weird time when that industry changed dramatically. It all went digital. Like in that year I was gone. So I come back and everyone's like, oh, it's a totally different thing. You don't qualify for anything. So I'm like, well, I'll do the antique thing for a while. I'll see how it goes. And it's been you know a couple of decades now. Um, so then I started being there more often. And then, like I said, Adrian left. And then we re reincorporated as, as Obscura. And um, then pretty soon, like, the phone started ringing with these production companies. And some of them were legit. Some of them were, you know, not as legit or, you know, smaller companies. And then there's one company that they, like, I did research on them. Like, who are these people? And they do, like, uh, Pawn Stars. And they're, they're a bigger company. It's called uh, Left Field. And so they're like, hey, um, you know, we'd like to come in to interview you. So I'm like, sure, come on down. So uh, we set up an interview. And um, I kind of, you know, I'd watch some shows. So I kind of understood what they were looking for. And like in the interview, a couple of things I said actually ended up in the opening sequence for the show. There's a thing in the yeah. show where I say, you know, I'm obscuring your grandmother's antique shop. Well, unless she's a bit of a weirdo or a kook. That ended up, that was part of my interview, which ended up in the in the opening sequence. But anyway, it, they had like three or four shops. They kept whittling it down, kept whittling it down. And they'd be like, oh, like months would go by. We didn't hear anything. They're like, no, you're still in the running. Don't worry. You know, I'll let you know. And then one day they called up like, okay, you got the you got the show. Um, When do you want to, we're going to start filming in two weeks. Like, oh shit. So uh they so how do you how do you prepare? You can't really prepare. Well, that's the thing. And they're like, you just kind of wait for them to get there. Like, like we're here. That's the thing. And so they're like, look, just be you. Don't don't play Mike. You yeah. are Mike. I'm like, I'm Mike, I'm not acting as me. I am I am me. I've been doing it my whole life. They said just be natural. That's all we we're gonna tell you. And so we did six episodes, which is like the basic they do. We, we do the six episodes and, you know, they ask, like, who do you deal with and who are your customers and what kind of stuff? And I gave them a list of our customers, people I've been dealing with for years, and they film it and they send the six episodes to Discovery and we get this phone call from the production company. They're like, yeah, um, Discovery called us. They want you to go back in production right now. They want four more episodes. We want to bump it up to 10. 
I'm like, what? I said, it hasn't even aired yet. They're like, we're going back to production right now. So they, they liked it. They're like, look, this was, and we had a whole meeting. They said, this is, when we said you're a shop that deals in weird stuff, we had no idea. Like, we really thought, oh, yeah, yeah, you deal in weird crap, whatever. They were apparently impressed with it. They said it, it hardly ever happens that before even airs, they want to bump it up to 10. So we did the 10, and, like, they're like, where did you find these people? I'm like, these are our customers. These are really people I know. In the very first episode, there's a guy, Edgar Oliver, who um, wants a straight jacket. And uh, they're like, oh, my God, this guy's amazing. And he actually went on. He did, he did other per, uh, commercial work, and, and he, he's a he's a poet. And he performs and stuff, but there's a lot of him, but this is like, he's again, not a character. He's just him, but he kind of sounds a little bit like something between like Peter Lorre and I don't know. He's a, he's a very interesting, yeah. amazing, sweet, gentle, uh, hysterical guy, but they're like these people. Like, I'm like, yeah, these are our people, man. These are our friends. These are, this is the East Village, man. This is like, yeah. it was still like the old East Village where you still had all these eclectic people and all these interesting, unusual, you know, unique people and stuff. So, and then the show did great from there. It just took off. We ended up doing, I think, 73 episodes aired. It was Yeah, because in- you were saying, like, the premise of the show is basically what you guys were doing already. So there wasn't really acting. I would exactly. say it's not like how it is now where, like, I have friends who do stuff, and they're like, it's very coached. Oh, some of them are so coached. And even yeah. with ours, I mean, it's legit what, what we do. What I, buy, I mean, of course, there's a condensed version of it, and the people know that we're being filmed, but it wasn't scripted. You know, like, say you're coming in, they, they had people looking for stuff, uh, you know, on online and at shops, and they would kind of have researchers looking for oddball stuff, and they found something they thought was cool. They said, okay, we want you to bring this into the shop and try to sell to them or, or buy it or, you know, whatever. And they said, well, what do you mean? They said, just that's the premise. You go in there, look around, talk to them. They didn't tell us what the item was, and they said there's no script. Just as long as you land on this item, that's all that counts. So people would come in, and they would. And we knew they were coming in. They knew they were coming in because there's cameras and everything. And we'd start talking about stuff, and they would ask about stuff. And that's the, the show was very um, – it, it's as realistic as you could possibly make it because a lot of that was just us chit-chatting and just improvising and just legit talking about stuff. And people would loosen up and get kind of used to it. And then finally they said, oh, well, actually, I want to sell this. And then we'd talk about that thing. So, so a lot of a lot of these shows you watch, it's so scripted. Yeah, it's painfully yeah. scripted. Um, this show was unusual in that it was not scripted. Well, you know, again, the the premise was there, but how we get to that item, it so, I mean, it sounds natural. like it was ahead of its time. I mean, it sounds like it was the show before what every rundown terrible show is that, you know, it's just right. a scripted nonsense. But, I mean, um, to have them come in and then you interact, I mean, what's awesome is how the show – or, I mean, how it was that you explained with, like, just the hanging out and all that. It really prepared you for – That's what we did. And, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, but if they would have chose any other shop, they would have had to coach them into how you guys are. Well, and that's the thing. And they actually did a spinoff show. There's a shop out in San Francisco called Love to Death my friend Audra owns, and they made that Oddities San Francisco but they were trying to make it like our show. And I'm like, well, Audra's not me. You know, like, they're them. We're us. And let them be themselves and stuff. And they made it a little scripty. And, like, certain shows you watch. Like, I don't watch a ton of reality TV, to, uh, to be honest. But no. sometimes I'll watch it. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so fake. I can't I can't watch this. You know, the kind of thing where they knock on the door and the camera's already on the inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, like, if you pay attention to production at all. It drives me nuts. <laughs> and, and just certain things they'll say. And you can see their faces because they know that, like, you know, some production person's like, oh, say this. Make this stupid joke. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. They really, we, 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 we lucked out. We had a really good director, uh, a guy named Dave Bowles, who was just fantastic. He's worked on a ton of stuff. But he's like, look, uh, he was really, like, on our side. And every once in a while, you know, the network would say, oh, could you do this? And he's like, look, that's that's ridiculous, man. And I even told him, I'm like, look, yeah, we're, we're, we're the dancing monkeys. We're performing, you know, whatever. I said, but there's certain shit that I am not going to do. You know, like, uh, it, it, it's, and, and I was even coached by, you know, some people said, listen, it's better it's easier not to give them something than to ask them not to do it. Like, you know, be careful what you say. Be careful what you do. If they ask you to do something stupid, don't do it if you don't want to do it. Because if you do it, they're probably going to use it. Yeah. And to get them not to is a real pain in the butt. Just put it and, over there. Uh, I'll grab it. Okay. So that's the thing. I mean, he was really sympathetic and he was really a great director. And um, it, it shows. I mean, you know, it really, because at one point they did one sp- another spinoff 
called the Odd Folks Home, which was basically, you know, on our show, each segment was, you know, five minutes, whatever. This was like a deep dive on these people. So it'd be like half an episode about this one person, what they do, what they collect. Oh, so they life. would so they would be like, so if a guy came in and he's like looking for the shoe, right. then they would like go to his house and be like, Okay, well, what's the story behind this guy who wants right, the shoe? Right, that was the the spinoff. Yeah. But the the first not a bad concept. Well, the problem they had with it is the first director they had didn't get the show. Ugh. And he'd be like, hey, be weird. Say something weird. Say, be weird. <laughs> and then saying that to a weird person is like, oh, you want me to shut down completely and stop talking to you? Exactly. <laughs> that's what happened a few times. People, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it's even with funny people where they're like, ah, oh, this guy's so funny. You be funny. And be it's funny. Like, I can't. I'm, I'm not your. Tell oh, me I don't some know. jokes. I used to, uh, we go out to the bar. And people be like, oh, he's funny. Act funny. And I'd be like, now I'm not doing shit. I'm not your fucking dancing idiot. That, like, and you know, I just I like being funny. And like weird people are just weird. It has to be and natural. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, and, especially if you start telling a weird person, oh, you know what you should do is start acting this way. That you know, it, we had they're weird to begin troubles. with. <laughs> they actually had to bring our director in to reshoot like half the stuff. And yeah. a few people were like, dude, I'm gone. I'm not doing anything with these people. Yeah, like, they they really so like having the wrong director, having the wrong crew, having the wrong production company could ruin your show. You could yeah. have the worst show. So, you know, there are issues. Like I said, this guy had no idea. He was like, you know, come on, monkey, dance, perform, yep. be weird. And then people are like, I'm out, see ya. So, you know, there, there can be issues with these things. But um, luckily, our show did well. It ended up being um, shown worldwide on Discovery and translated into at least four or five languages, um, which That's is awesome. weird. It was. What was that like? I mean, yeah, I mean, because you're just talking like, yeah. I mean, I get that you lived through all this, and it was just the way your career and life has went, and which is the best part about you is because you're just being you. But um, what was it like having a fucking show and being on TV and driving into fucking work and being like, like there's got to be times when you're like going to work and being like, what the fuck? Like all the time I'm on a fucking TV show. <laughs> well, even <laughs> like I thought I was a photographer. Like well, what that, the fuck is going on? That's the thing. And like the first time it aired, when the ver the premiere of it, we went out to a local local bar and we watched it on their TV but it felt like you know like when you're a kid and you're screwing around the video camera your friends making a little yeah. video it felt like that yeah and so I get home it's like I don't know two three in the morning and I get home and TV is on and I'm looking I'm like wait that's me what the fuck man like it was the weirdest thing <laughs> and, and then it got to the point people would randomly start to recognize me in places like you're that guy aren't you I'm like uh yeah yeah I'm that guy whatever um but it was a weird thing like sometimes I would forget or like even still like in the oddities world you know people know me and you know I'm well known in it because it helped to make that popular and sometimes I'll like introduce, you know, I'm, I'm not an a hole, so I'm like, oh, hi, Mike, nice to meet you. And I'll, you know, introduce myself. People go, I know who you are. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not a dick, so I'm not going to be like, yeah, you know, yeah, do you yeah, know yeah. who I am? I, I've never pulled that, do you know who I am bullshit. And I see people do it, and, you know, it, it does go to some people's heads. Um, that's just not me, you know, I'm, I'm me. But it's, it's funny, you know, like uh, randomly people would come up to me sometimes and be like, oh my God, I really love your show. Can I get a picture with you? I'm like, uh, okay. So, like, randomly taking pictures of the people in public, and other people are like, what the hell's going on over there? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How long? So, what year was it when the show finally, like, what was their decision to kind of wrap the show up? They were just going in a different direction, and they, you know. Well, it was kind of weird. We, we were top rated on the network. Like I said, it was in at least five or six languages worldwide. It, we were very, very popular. We were supposed to do another season, and we're about to go into pre production. And, um, they change. They end up firing the head of the network. Uh, they 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 basically changed the whole network. They shut it down. They they got rid of like uh, they changed the they. Let me see. They fired the president of the network. All her people were gone. All her shows were gone, which were us. Yeah. Um, they basically shut it down. They did all new, no stopped all production. No new anything for a long time. And they still don't have any a lot of no, new stuff on. Yeah. Discovery, it's always when Discovery shit's ruined. Has, has pulled some stuff. Um, even like um. What's the, uh, uh, what is it called? The, the, the car show with the fucking Texas guy. What the hell is it? The, oh, Jesse James? That no, one no, that one they kicked off too. And they yeah. like, well, he had some issues, but yeah, he did, but he, he got off and that's why he's doing it on, uh, yeah, he went on, to another on channel. Discovery Plus or whatever, Discovery thing. But no, the one, um, I'm going to say it's not Monster Car Garage. The one, uh, Gas Monkey Garage. Yes. Oh, okay. So they were top rated. Tons of merch, tons yeah. of everything, and all of a sudden it was like, "Hey, we're not coming back because Discovery says they own everything and they don't yeah. want to let us." And he's like, "No, it's like my shop, like it's my well, stuff." It's kind of weird with that. Like, yeah. the, usually the show will never be the name of the shop. My shop was obscure yeah. antiques and oddities. 
our TV shows called oddities. Even yep. like Pawn Stars, their Golden Silver Pawn Shop. Yes. And um, Orange County, uh, American Choppers is Orange County. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, because once they have the show, they own the name. They own everything. So and I guess they gave him some problem. And he was like, if it's listen, I want to keep doing this. And they were like, well, we want you to do this. And he goes, no, I'm not going to be fake. Like, I'm not going to do that. And that's the thing. Often, you know, it depends on the network as well. Some networks are just total bullshit and you watch it like yeah. this is the stupidest thing i've ever watched well look at look at pawn stars they had remember they had detroit pawn oh you exactly that right. was miserable that, that was, was scripted as scripted as it can be i feel like and anytime Harvard. there's anything good the networks ruin it even with vice they had a uh, fuck that fuck that's delicious yeah. and they tried to steal a show and he was just yeah. an action bronson was like i'm out go fuck yourself now he does the whole thing on youtube he's pulling yeah. fucking five hundred thousand to a million hits so he's getting making more a, money yeah probably. I mean, he's doing it all by himself. I mean, he's always been one to to do everything kind of on his own. And he thanked Vice and was like, everybody at the network wasn't an asshole. I love yeah. the people that worked on the show. But you're not stealing my show. Well, that's and, the thing with that, networks, too. Yeah, they ruin everything. Every show out there is someone's baby. Yep. And when that person gets replaced, the new person's like, I'm going to eat that baby and make my own. That's right. And <laughs> they and they, they fuck it up half the time. Yep. You know, they, they want to come in and make their mark or, or get, rid, get rid of that show. We want to make our show. Yeah. And it happens all the time. There are people yeah. who've been working there for decades when they're out all their people all their shows all their everything get you know eat them out of there and and that happens all the time so we were two weeks out from filming another season we pre-production ready to go this is what season six um yeah this it would have been yeah we did i think 73 aired Dude, five seasons is that's a fucking long time yeah we were ready to go i mean they had more already done you know again two weeks out from filming they're like oh the president was just fired, and uh, every, we're just stopping everything. And, and they still had like five or six shows left from that season. They dumped them all on a Sunday afternoon, no announcement, nothing. Just like at like two o'clock on a Sunday, all of a sudden it's like a marathon, a marathon of, yeah. of new episodes, and then that was it. Like, well, your ratings weren't good. I'm like, you dumped the last six, set, you know, yeah. unannounced on a Sunday afternoon. Like, what the? Anyway, so that's what happened to the show. But it was a popular show, and you know, they were at one point talking about maybe trying to bring it back. Um, and people still like it. It's still, I mean, been off the you know new shows have been off for five years now, six years. People still like the show. Oddities are still popular, you know, as a genre of, of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's you know, I mean, it's a perfect wood, formula. It's, still going. it's a perfect formula. Anyone passing to the channel seems some sees something that weird. Like, well, what's that? Mm -hmm. And then they're in, then now they're invested in the show. Oh well, this is a show that does this all the time. Like right. it's not something where you're passing through and you see dialogue like from friends. Or I don't fucking care. Yeah. But <laughs> you see, you know, you catch a Ouija board or you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, that interaction. And I think that's why Pawn Stars was so um, you know popular because like, it's we were, just weird yeah. stuff. And we were talking before right. the show and like where the basis of your show is you know you have something different constantly. Mm -hmm. There's an attraction to seeing more and more and more. You know, it's like you know going to a, a circus and going behind the curtain and being. And like, oh, you know, like, what's the new thing that's coming on here? Yeah. And I love stuff like that. And I also noticed once our, once our show started becoming popular, some of the other shows started having more weird stuff on it. You know, like so they uh, kind of pulled some from you guys. to Yeah, I think they did. I mean, well, Pawn Stars is the same production company. So I know the production people. Well, talk and, that, and, and not only that, they also have when they do like marathon stuff, they'll have like automobiles and this so they'll have weird stuff and That's, it'll be yeah. literally they'll have only that stuff on those shows i i believe the weird stuff is influenced from my yeah. show. i could be wrong but i it's my opinion that i you know yeah. I, I think it, it influenced that kind of thing and even like you know pickers like they started going to actually they went to um the, park yeah. i got i got called actually when they did that episode it was right when i signed the contract and i got a call from their production company saying we know you guys deal in oddball stuff and these guys are going to go look at some sideshow stuff. Are you, you know, can you um, be on the show as an expert? You know, because again, I, I've been buying and selling sideshow banners for years. And I'm like, yeah, let me make one quick phone call. And I had to call our production company, the lawyers, make sure we could do it. And when I got back to them, I said, oh, we already got Billy from, uh, there's another shop in New York, this guy Billy, who I mentioned to them. And um, so I was almost on Pawn Stars as well in the very yeah. beginning, which would have been kind of weird. But I mean, even that's kind of a bit nonsense. They bought it from Bushkill Park over here. Yep. Yes. And then they actually they actually came back. Bush, Those dudes are legit. Bushkill never had a sideshow. It, no, no, it was just old. Yeah. It was, old it was an stuff. old like uh, yeah. so it was old. What was it? Stuff. Balloons the clown. Or Balloons something. the clown bought and it. Yeah, that park is known because it's a roller skating. It's just, rink yeah. I think, I think it's because it was so old 
that just the style of it was kind of odd. Oh, it's amazing that back place, then. Yeah. But what happened was those guys actually came back. They gave them more money. They gave or more something. money because they were like, we made a lot of money off. Well, of there's it. also a lot of criticism I know in the early Pawn Star and uh, Picker stuff where like we bought it for seventy, we sold it for seven hundred, yeah, and like people like you're ripping people off. Yeah, uh, yeah. How dare you make money at the job you created? It's weird. Well, <laughs> you know what though? It's it's one of those things that it's like they come across as certain kinds of people and like listen like. We're trying to make money. You're trying to make money and selling stuff. Well, it's a business. And it's... you don't want to be like, like, even, I mean, think about it. Even Pawn Stars. I mean, there's one episode, a lady comes in and it's just this ugly brooch. And she's just like, I don't know. I think I want like $1,000. And he's like, I'm going to give you 30000 And she's mm-hmm. like, what? And he goes, you don't understand. Like, that's a diamond. That's an onyx. That's a thing. Like, mm-hmm. to do that is, I think, helps them a lot more than just being like, yeah, I'll give you 500 bucks. Yeah. And then right. ripping them off. Right. Also, being that it's televised and stuff, it makes yeah. it look better. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they don't uh, yeah. do that when the cameras aren't. That, that's yeah, that's right. where they're like, "Here, guys, here's the scripts for today." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. The Bushka Park episode. That was cool that they did that. But um, I feel bad for that place because it's not a good spot. Well, they just got it's, flooded out again. It, was like, it floods every time because it's a bowl. Stop yeah. it. Move yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember last time it flooded. Which it's like was... the people who live on the river and bitch. Yeah, we don't get why our house floods because you're next to a fucking river. Yeah, it flooded uh, like six months ago again. Like a huge flood came yep. through there. And there was a, on their Facebook page, it had a whole list of stuff that's missing that got washed down stream somewhere. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a cool old place. I'd love to see it all back. But again, you know. It's going to get flooded again. But <laughs> I'm saying gonna... is, how didn't it get flooded all those years ago? Oh, it must have. They just, you know, yeah. I guess it's popular. Just, just keep it was just in the it. newspaper at that time. Yeah, the newspaper. <laughs> it wasn't on the internet. Yeah. yeah. Um. So then the show kind of went its separate way, and you guys were still doing the shop at that time? Yeah, I mean, the shop existed before the show. Yeah, and, so and it's after. like you were just, you know, you're still doing the same exact thing. There just isn't a production crew there. Correct, right. And, and the thing is, people still, you know, Coming out from, you know, New York City is a big tourist town, and yeah. so we get people from all over. Um, although the business changed. I mean, since the success of the show, like, everyone and their cousin opened up an Audi shop. Like, every yeah. city and town has one, and people are like, oh, I love this. I want to open a shop just like yours. I'm like, yeah, don't. Um, <laughs> 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 and uh, so it got to the point, too, where, um, you know, people are like, well, I found this weird thing. I could either call these guys in New York City and ship it, blah, 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 or just go my local guy, and he'll give me a couple hundred bucks, and I'm done. So the business changed a bit and the city changed a lot. Uh, that area, like uh, it's all gentrified. It's all, you know, million dollar starter condos overlooking some yep. din- dingy street and stuff. I mean, that's outrageous. And, you know, the people in the neighborhood are not really the customers so much anymore. A friend of mine overheard these guys right next to our shop was this building. They, they renovated, added some built some floors to it. It was like the party building. And they advertised it as like, you know, the, like the hottest dorm, blah, blah, blah. And it was always like noise complaints. And a friend of mine overheard these two guys talking in front of my shop. It's like at night. And like, oh, man, I want to move this place. But look at this creepy ass shop. here. I don't want to live above this oddities crap place. So like stuff like that. And she's like, OK, you're moving to like the East Village. <laughs> but yeah. everything about the East Village you hate, you know? And, yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. You want to change it to make it look like the way you want it to look. And it's, you know, multi-million dollar condos all over the place there now. And construction is like, well, these people aren't buying this stuff. You know, they, and, and you know, we got a lot of uh, tourists, but also you get a lot of people who like, oh, I spent all this money to come to New York and they'll come in and buy like a $5 thing. Um, so it, the, the business had changed quite a bit. I mean, it's still decent. How long were you guys doing it by that time? Um... We incorporated in 2001, so it was like 18, 19 years God officially. Damn. But a couple years before that, we'd That's been That's a long time before. to survive, though. Yeah, it was a small business. <laughs> and then get into a TV show, then out of a TV show. Like, yeah, you it's, know, it's, and it says like, a lot for your shop. And in the meantime, I, you know, building up the Facebook page, building up the Instagram page, uh, TikTok, you know, all this kind of stuff I'm doing. Um, I use Facebook, I use my page, my zone page, but also the obscure page a bit. And then I started doing this thing. Um, so I started doing it online. Once we decided to close the shop, uh, I was going to do online, which has actually been decent. Uh, Instagram is pretty busy. Um, I'm at the post office a lot for that. But also I was doing events, the oddities market. That's what um, I want to get into. So I, I was doing uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Nashville, Atlanta, and a few other ones. My idea was to do six of them, one every other month. That way to keep me busy with that and sell online. And that's all on hold right now. 
So with COVID and stuff, looking yeah. to. But I, I want to break down what that is because we talked about it when you came here, and uh, I I I think the idea is is awesome. Um, I think what you did and how you did that, I think it, it's going to be so fucking rad when it comes back to doing events, and I think it's going to be sooner than later. Um, so like basically, what you would explain to me is that you uh, were kind of finding lots, and then you were handpicking like mm -hmm. really good vendors to have, and then you were kind of having like. Um, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll let you explain it, but break it right. down a little bit more than just be oh, like, "Oh, sure," because you, <laughs> yeah. they're the they're the best people, though. They're like, "Yeah, we just did this thing," and then like he was telling me about it, and I'm like, "Man, that's fucking rad that you have this like festival it's of curated. like that, these <laughs> odd things, but you're like not just taking anybody to make money, like right. you're making it very specific and very genuine, which is why the shop was fucking awesome." Well, and that's the thing; it's it's a curated market. Um, I had been doing indoors. We did one last October uh, in um, Glen Mills, PA, which is outside of Philly. And that was an outdoor place. It was at a, a haunt called uh, Bates Motel. Big open. What was that? The door. Oh. Uh, big giant. Um, You're all right. Basically farmland. You can sit here or over there if you want. Hello. That's Hi. Glad, Mag glad you make it. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so the idea is, again, it's a curated market of, of odd stuff. And I, I've done enough shows, and, you know, you do some shows, some are better than others. So I decided to do a show that I would want to do. And so I try to limit the amount of vendors, 50, so I'd say 40 to 75, depending on how big it is. And it's all curated. So I have people submit, you know, applications, and I don't want too much of the same thing. I could do it all jewelry, but then that's not fair to the jewelry dealers, or people will show up and be like, why is this all jewelry? Or why is this all bugs? Or why is this all whatever? Now, where did you come up with the idea where you just kind of flat on the store and you kind of saw that it was kind of going in different directions and you wanted to start bringing different people to, you know what I mean? Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a killer idea. So, I mean, did you go to, like, a tattoo convention and see the the markability of doing an oddity-style thing? Like, what kind of drove you to just want to get... Because the amount of thought and effort you put into it where you're like, you know, like, it's not just like, hey, I got this thing, like even when you were saying when you like took a piece of property and you're doing it outside and you know what I mean? Like where did that all get driven from for the creative side of well, it? Well, I, I have done like flea markets and like, punk rock fleas and, and, and tattoo shows and stuff like that. And there was a place in Brooklyn called the morbid anatomy library. And they used to do a show, a uh, small in the first, they started in their basement and they went to a bigger place, but still kind of small. And they were sort of doing a market as well. And they eventually went out of business. They, uh, long story, but they, 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 they reformed as a smaller organization, but they don't do that. So longer story, but make it short, basically took that idea and went with that. Yeah. Since people know about oddities and, and that kind of thing, like, well, why don't we do one? And um, yeah, started off like the Philly one. The last Philly one I did, you know, four or 5,000 people showed up. It was, you know, really busy. The thing is <laughs> I have- Once again, just acting like that's not a large amount of it people. It was great. You're it my was... favorite guest so far. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just 5,000 people ah, show up. Four or 5,000. We had a TV show. We're famous and shit. Yeah, move on. Well, I sell some stuff. Here's a human head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, though. Like, um, we have the notoriety. Like, my, you know, the, the Instagram is 77,000 on there. But again, it's just yeah. organically built it yeah. over time. But and that's it, what we talked about when you got here. I said, why, like, it's such a fun page to follow. It's like I have the dumb stuff that I r scroll through on a daily basis, and then it'll be like velvet painting, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> or like I scroll through, and then it, you know, Ouija board. Like it's mm -hmm. not. It's constantly changing. It's it's, it's, such, it's such a solid follow. Well, thank you, and and that's the thing. Like. My idea was to put on a show that I would want to do. I want to make sure there's not too much of the same kind of vendors. I want to make sure it's really diverse. I want, I you know, also want the customers to show up. You cared about the product before the money. Well, yeah. I mean, I could just stuff it full of anyone and a everything. A lot of people don't do that, though. Like, I, that's what makes right. it awesome is that there's plenty of people. I mean, I've been to them. I mean, she came with me. I went, I've been to some I went down to New Jersey, and they mm -hmm. sold me on the idea. I spent three grand on the whole thing. Fifty people showed up to the tattoo convention. Yeah. I mean, it was awful. You can I've ask her shows. how fun it was sitting in the hotel room afterwards oh, like pizza. yeah and i've done shows like that where afterwards i'm like i could have been asleep and been more productive yeah um so is that, that's the thing i wanted to put on the show that i would want to do yeah so you, that's want, a lot, you want it to last and that's the thing and the shows again i have a very good following so that helps a lot and again really good you know um vendors and it's a mix i mean i like more old stuff but there's also a lot of um there's a lot of crafty stuff in the in the oddities world. People who do like pinned insects, or people who do jewelry, or people who do, uh, you know, whatever. And so there's a mix of that, but there's also a mix of old stuff too. And and vendors who don't normally do these kind of things, like one guy, all he does is medical, antique medical stuff. A whole double booth filled with, 
you name it, any kind of creepy old medical thing. The guy just medicines and devices and strange, you know, whatever. So I'm looking for other vendors who aren't normally at these things and um it's been doing great you, you got to talk people into kind of setting up their own thing like have you talk, contacted like like a guy like that like are you like hey man like this would be awesome if you'd kind of set it up well once and, the word got out people started like hey dude i heard your show did really well i mean yeah you know good news oh, all news travels quickly even bad news um because that's the other thing i've been to some shitty shows people are like don't do don't, don't do this guy's show that sucks but my show has a really good reputation and you know i try this admission by trying to make it as fair i try to make it as fair as i possibly Possibly can still you know make it profitable but not like you don't have to be a pig about it you know that's that's the thing that's what ruins shows exactly and there's some you know promoters who just pack them in they'll take anyone i mean it shows like where yeah. there's the guy selling like you know gutters and chimney caps and shit well I mean, when, we, yeah. when we were there what what i found out that why there was no one there is because he did the same exact tattoo convention the weekend before and that so he went too back often. to back and i'm like um oh. and i didn't know anything i just went online and found a list of tattoo shops and they took a big name and they were like this guy's you know paul booth show new mm. jersey and then i went there he's not there yeah no one's there and then I'm just like, man, I borrowed someone's truck to get down here. It was yeah. like, it was a crushing point in my business where I could have ga- like given up because I yeah. lost that much money doing it. And that's the thing. And like people go to the show and like I'll be there or I'll have Evan be there as well. I have people from the show, I, the Philly, I had Edgar Oliver, the straight jacket guy. I gave him his own booth. I'm like, dude, I will keep bring you down here. I give him his free booth. And he was there signing his book and stuff. And I have people from from the TV show. I'll make I'll have them there. But they, people, like, oh my god, you're really here. I'm like. Yeah, my name's on this thing, man. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm here. You know, it's it's kind of a, a strange thing, but again, caring about your product and doing something right and, and not being a pig about it. And you know, like where I said, does that come from? Did that come from your did that come from your background in photography and giving a shit about that, or like just, was it how you were raised? I mean, I guess, not everybody is like that. Well, that's the thing, and and that's even like with the 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 show. A lot of people say, you know, I like how you treat people. Like these are kind of like you know oddball people, not your typical you know nine to five or, you know squares and stuff you know there are the unusual people but you treat them like people i'm like yeah well yeah man you know what am i a dick like why wouldn't i treat yeah you're you? not a you're not a circus uh I, i'm not yeah i'm not ring la- leader you i'm know? not laughing at these people we, we 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 appreciate these people you know without people on the show or watching the show i wouldn't have a show you know it's just being a decent person really yeah and, and the people are like oh it's great you, you know like even on the show like you don't try to every last penny out of something i'm like i'm cool selling something for less for you know flip it and i get a good deal they get a good deal everyone's happy that was the first thing you said when you brought the paintings down we were talking about shit and you're like yeah i just find a solid price that i make a little bit of money and the people who buy the stuff get to buy it because you know if you did everything extremely overpriced you just have a bunch of shit in a garage right you're sitting on it like but i mean that's what's awesome though is because i bought one and then you're like yo i got this other piece that i think you might like i'll sell you both at this price and i was like Ah, that was a good price. And man. I was, it was a great price. And I bought them both. <laughs> yeah, but, I was like, you but know then, what? like a friend of mine was like, "Hey, man!" Like I showed him the unicorn, and he's mm-hmm. like, "Dude, could I put that in my studio?" And like mm-hmm. I love art. I'm obsessed with it. I buy it all the time. I stop buying it all, all the time, but yeah. following your page makes it very difficult. But um, mm-hmm. you know, like the guy, I I I gave it to him because yeah. he's gonna he's gonna put it in his studio and he's gonna hang it up. And it's a good story. And it's yeah. like, yeah, man, like it's going to a good home. Of course, I'll take both of them. Well, and that's the thing. Like I'd rather sell it quicker. Everyone's happy. You know, the best deals when everyone's yeah. happy. You yeah. know, and that's the thing. There's some dealers I go to, and you're like. I don't even look at their booth because they're too expensive and they're kind of dicks. You know, I'm like, I, who wants to deal with that? So I think it's just, just you know, I want to deal. They want to deal. Every, you know, just trying to make a, just make it so everyone kind of makes that okay. You know. Yeah. And, how many How many actual live events did you do before COVID? Um, I try to remember. We basically a, a five, four, five. So it was kind of like the next step. And mm-hmm. where the business was going, it's like the shop was doing its thing, but this is obviously something that's branching out. It's making money. You're doing things. You're doing, you know, you're doing more things with the community, and it kind of looks like this is the direction of where the actual mm-hmm. business is going to go. And then COVID hit and kind of shut everything down. Basically, or were you yeah. out of the were you out of the spot before all this, or were you in both and doing the in both? So I was yeah. at the at the shop and I started doing these shows, and then once we decided to close, I'm like, okay, well maybe if I could do like six of them like one every other month i could do that and some online and that will kind of you know the thing is in this business and even like what i collect and what sells it always changes you know you have to kind of keep it changing all the time if you just do the same thing it's all going to change and you'll be in the same position and you're going to be left behind so you know it, it as it changes and kind of going with the um 
with, with the, the trends are going with what is working and, you know, trying to do that. Of course, now everyone in the cousins trying to do a, a, a show as well. I mean, yeah. there's other ones. There's one coming up and someone's like, oh, is that yours? I'm like, it's not mine. It has my name on it. It's mine. I just tell people that yeah. for any other shows because there's other promoters who also do a similar show. Yeah. And, and then uh, the, the thing that people find out when they go there is it may be similar, but it is not the quality show that you're getting. Uh, yeah. I mean, I like to, you know, believe I put on a good show. And, yeah. You know, we've, we've had people try and recreate this show. Uh, right here in the Lehigh Valley. They are no they longer doing suck. that show. <laughs> <They> uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know, I mean, you know, whatever. It's, mm -hmm. People see a good idea and then they try and steal it. Oh, but all the time. The reason um, that your shit works is because it was an original idea. Well, that's the thing. Exactly. It's it, and, and that's the thing. I mean, we're known for this. And, you know, and I've seen a lot of shops that like try to, you know, kind of look like Obscura or they use the same font and they call it whatever antiques and oddities like there are a couple that are like just a, a total ripoff you yeah. know like the name is very similar i'm like dude that looks that looks like our logo i mean what the hell like oh no it's not it's different uh i'm like here's my logo and here's yours like what the fuck man so you yeah, know there's some people who the, the, yeah there's a billion words in the language you know use something different than obscura yeah in, in your name now with covid hitting um that obviously shut down temporarily has shut down your uh, ability to do the outside vending and um you know i think it's a, a good part of the story as well as right before covid hit you guys decided to get out of renting that space which you'd yeah. still be paying for oh, we dodged a major bullet with that i mean like i said the business had, you're in new york city in the village <laughs> our, the, the rent was outrageous yeah and, i mean just the overhead. did the rent change over the years the way that the, oh. the more people yeah yeah <laughs> i'm kept, sure like in the very beginning like our old old shop it was 250 square feet a tiny shop it was 250 dollars a month Dirt. You can't. You can't get a parking spot for two fifty a month in New York City. Yeah. And then you know it went up to like five hundred, and then it was like a thousand. You know, it was still kind of low enough, but you know by the end it was it was pretty high. We had four hundred fifty square feet, and rent alone was almost five grand a, yeah. a month. You know, and that doesn't include payroll and and utilities and garbage carting and commuting and parking and tolls and fees and licenses and insurance and this 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 and the other thing so it got to the point where i'm like we're not making any money man all every you know money comes in it goes right back out and um so it got to the point where like you know this business is just not what it was and like i said you know we we were still doing okay but it, it really the business had changed so much. I'm like, this is not worth it. And if we sign this lease, we're going to be in for another couple of years. And then COVID hit, and I'm like, we would have been screwed. What was we, it? Two weeks before COVID hit, you walked away from the lease. Um, it was a little earlier. We we technically it ended, I think, in um December, but we were there for like a month cleaning out, kind of a thing. So like February or so is the last time I was in New York City. Not yeah. this last, but the one before that. You know, just clearing that the place out. That would have sucked. They would have hammered you with that yeah, rent. We would have been made screwed. You just pay it. And it was the, the landlord. He was a nice enough guy, but he just owned that building, and he's like a designer and stuff. But he would have been. We would have been screwed. We would have been in a giant hole. We would have probably lost everything. Yeah. So, so when you, uh, well, you obviously dodged that bullet. So, you, um, now your vision of where everything's going to go, and you know, with doing the Instagram and online, it seems like you're doing well with that. Do you see kind of where the business is going? I mean, when we get back to normal, and it seems like events and things. I know the UFC is coming back, right. and they're bringing full audiences, and I think. May or uh, May and of May, they're doing full audiences. Yeah. So I mean, maybe not this summer, but the following summer. I'm mean, eventually you're going to get back to being able to do what you did. I hope um, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, um, you know, and then you're online. Is that where you see the business going? Is doing the festivals and so far? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like I said, it always changes. I mean, it'd be great if I could. You know, online's been decent. I'm selling less than I did at the store, but it's good because my overhead is a fraction of what it was. Yeah. You're not paying the rent. That's the thing, and and uh, it gives you more time to go out and find stuff, and you know that kind of thing. As far as the events go. I mean, as long as people are buying it, people are still into it. I, I would like to keep doing them, um, but it depends. Like I said, the outdoor show that I do where everything was really spread out and it'll be a while, I think, before it goes back to normal. But the other thing is people are they want to buy stuff. You know, everyone's been cooped up. Everyone's been yeah. socially isolated. People want to buy stuff, you know, even like I'll put like small stuff on. Like I just got those glow in the dark groceries, 10 bucks a yeah. pop. They were cheap. 
they sold like crazy because they're cheap little, you know, doodads and stuff. So I think people want to buy stuff. They want to get out. They want to, you know, shop. They want to feel a little more normal and familiar and and that. So like as long as the stuff keeps going, I'll keep selling it, I guess. And then, you know, eventually figure out what the next thing is. And you think you'll go back to brick and mortar or maybe bring it to the valley? I had thought about that, but then I'm stuck at the store. You know, that's the thing yeah. with the store. You have to be there. It's it's like having two jobs in this business. One job going out to find stuff, going to the markets, going to the shows, going to that stuff. And the other job is being at the store. Or if you're not there, you got to pay someone. And yep. that just makes it more expensive. And then it's not just paying someone. It's paying somebody that's into doing this. And they're not going to just be like, what do you right. want? And someone you could trust, right? Because, yeah. I mean, they get paid whether they sell things or not. Or, you know, you hope they don't put something in their pocket or let their friends, you know, it's really hard to run a business by yourself. Um, Are you still running it? Are you running it by yourself now or yeah. online and doing everything? Are all the partners gone? And this yeah, is just this, you? this is just me right yeah. now. So I'm running myself, but it's small enough that I can still manage it. Because, yeah. again, I don't yeah. have the you know, a, a physical, but that's jump. a good feeling to be able to have the control of how far you want to go with it because oh, absolutely. you can, you know, uh, like I said, you know, when you are able to do festivals, if you want to do them again, you're like, all right, well, you know, like they, they seem to be dying down a little bit, but what we're going to do is just kind of do one in the fall, one, in the, you know, one, the right. summer. And then it's like, you know, I have my, that's how I, you know, my income for that. And then, you know, we'll just do the creative stuff online and just mm -hmm. kind of push it on Instagram. Like there's definitely a, a, you could, I mean, you're doing it now, but I mean, there's definitely a way, to oh, keep it yeah. going. Oh, I think so. And that's the thing. Just being that I'm running it now is that I can make all the decisions. I don't have yeah. to. You don't have to nice. Be, you don't have to, you know, having partners has its benefits, but also it's, you know, also it's uh, detriments and <laughs> it's issues and problems. So it, it kind of worked out okay so far. Um, I want to get into show and tell. You have sure. so much cool stuff. Um, yeah, this is a bunch of stuff uh, from my collection. Some of it I just got recently, like that photo that just came in. We'll just start from here and we'll go all the way over. Um, you could hold it up to this camera here. Sure. And then we'll get a little bit. And then what I want to do is I want to start doing this monthly where you just bring extremely weird shit in and then we just kind of bullshit about it all. Yeah, yeah. I get stuff all the time. Like it. I'm out buying stuff and I have I've been collecting for 30 years at this point. So yeah. I got a lot of stuff. Uh, this is kind of neat. I brought this, and this is actually the oldest Ouija board that I own. Uh, this one is from about 1890. Is it haunted? Um, you know, I never. People ask me that all the time. He I, said it was. I thought you had a private conversation I, with. I, no, you I were did have the spirits in here. I told you not to touch it because it was haunted. <laughs> I never claim stuff is haunted, or people use that, and I always say, "Well, yeah. go sold separately." I pick up on stuff like that. So. It doesn't feel haunted to you. I mean, the funny thing is people, like Ouija boards, people really flip out about, like I, you know, I go to markets, like, oh, I'm looking for this, that, a Ouija board, some people are like, oh, dude, man, those are scary, be really careful with that, I'm like, it's it's a, it's not special wood or ink or anything. Now, do you know the history behind this? Like, I mean, I don't know much about Ouija boards, but I mean, is this prior to, is this a version of it being sold, or was this something that was used way back in the day, like before it became a novelty? Well, Ouija, by trademark Ouija, came out in 1890, a guy named Charles Kennard uh, takes claim uh, for inventing the board. However, there are earlier boards and earlier spirit um, communication devices. And there's an earlier board called a witch board, which is the first one, and another one called the New Planchette, which was in the 1880s was in a, news, in a newspaper. It, it's almost identical. But but Charles Kennard is is known as the uh, inventor or is credited as the inventor of the Ouija board. This is like the very first one. They first started making these in 1890. They didn't get their patent until 1891. And this one, I know it's a little hard to see, but it says Ouija trademark, but it doesn't say registered. So this is early. And actually on the back, uh, it's a little hard to see, but it has it does have the patent blind stamp on here from 1891. Uh, the early ones were made like this with these uh, panels, and they had to put rails in the back because they separate. Later, like in the mid-1890s, they went to a solid piece. Um, so, yeah, this is a pretty early, early Ouija board. I'm also part of an organization called the Talking Board uh, Historical Society, TBHS. It's all about early Ouija's spirit communications, although we're all uh, skeptics, which is kind of cool. Um, TBHS.org is the, the thing, and we've done things like um, the world's largest Ouija board, which was uh, shown in Salem, Mass., two years ago in Halloween. So this is an organization that you're a part of that's just all about Ouija boards? Ouija boards and, and other related Are they stuff. also local? 
um, all over. The guy who started is in Denver, Colorado. A couple of uh, down, I think, in Texas, we have a member or two. Uh, Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, kind of spread My out. My brain's just reeling where if you have other people that are doing Ouija board stuff, we could do a whole episode on Ouija boards and turn the lights down and let's get weird. I have a lot of, uh, yeah. Some- and he'll get so scared. Nope. Yeah, I, I have friends with even. Would like, you want to do something like that? Nope. I could talk to him. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure they'd be get interested. Weird. Oh, here absolutely. we go. Here we go. I love making him do stuff he doesn't so, want to do. So yeah, that's, that's uh, awesome. How so, the hell do you get into a Ouija board society? Uh, good question. Did they contact you? The spirits. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I knew a bunch of guys who were in it, and I've been collecting them and dealing with them for years. And yeah, uh, I was a, at one point. Yeah, I just was, I'm, I'm, I mean, you are so thoroughly knowledge on all of this is this just from you researching it and then you just are so into yeah. it like you know you're, re- was, you're telling this like you're reading a book it's well i've always found this interesting i mean certain things like i said I'm, I'm a total skeptic you know i don't believe in like i have a bunch of these and i've had people like oh be careful i'm like honestly you know even better things. maybe we'll bring you on and then <laughs> i'll get somebody who's totally all in and was like no we are talking to spirits oh i know a lot of people argue down here <laughs> i know people who are and, and like i said most of the guys in the tbhs the directors are skeptical yeah and they have incredible collections of the stuff i mean really you know historical stuff and, halloween um, episode <laughs> let's go I could bring all sorts of stuff um what else do i bring uh this what do you is- want to go next into the perversion or do you want to get into the skull Either way, we'll get to both. All right. Uh, this is kind of a deep piece. I bought this many years ago. It is a wooden, hand-carved wooden mold. You'll see the hole here is to fill it. And uh, I'll put it like that. Uh, it's actually a Victorian dildo mold. Um, <laughs> there you go. So um, back during Victorian times and, and earlier, uh, what they there was a, a, um, an ailment, a, a female ailment called uh, hysteria. And what the idea was, they thought that the, uh, the uterus would, would move around the body from not being used. And um, so doctors would, would stimulate women in their offices. And the idea is what the stimulate, they thought was the stimulation would bring the uterus back into place. And it would, um, they thought like certain like uh, ailments, like mental ailments were caused by this uh, issue with the body. So um, they started like vibrators and stuff started from that so people could at the at not have with a doctor to uh, stimulate uh, ladies. And they would also have devices like this. Uh, this would have used like a natural plant rubber. And um, yeah, it's kind of neat. The, a friend of mine named uh, Tony Perot, he actually writes about antique naughty stuff. He wrote a, a, a book about Napoleon's penis, which is still around, by the way. Uh, it was owned by a dentist in Jersey, although he passed away. Um, and he wrote about this, uh, is it King, um, is it English King had his like sex chair and he wrote about like brothels and, and like the sex um, tours of the 1890s. Anyway, he was like, hey, we should cast this thing, but we haven't yet, but we still might. You know, it'd be kind of kind of interesting. Um hard stuff to find no no pun intended um but uh yeah and this one actually i bought from a guy who bought it at a a church thrift store in virginia of all places yeah. but uh yeah i've had that did for they a know while. what it was i don't know yeah. I, would, I would hope so it's a fairly Somebody obvious form so uh yeah that's kind of a neat thing uh, i've had that for a while i also i have i didn't bring it but it's a a medis- uh, uh, apothecary jar that says anti-hyster- anti-hysteria on it. And it has, like, stuff. I have no idea what it is in there. It's some kind of powder. But, um, again, all these magic. sort of... It's magic. <laughs> magic. It's all sorts of stuff. Uh, unusual stuff to find that. But, uh, yeah, it could have been. Gonna... Any... Back then, it could have been anything. Anything. That could opium, who knows, knock whatever. Out. Yeah, probably opium. Uh, this is a cool piece. This actually, for people who have uh, seen my show... This is sort of like uh, almost a store mascot. So weird to touch. Um, so it's a, a real human head. Um, this actually, we we had um, I had snow globes made with a little miniature of this, and I had uh, keychains made, and we had T-shirts with this head. Uh, this is a medical preparation, probably from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, it's actually a woman's head. You can actually feel the stubble a bit on the on the head, but the face doesn't have it. Also, you'll see the brow ridge is really slight on this one. Um, that's more indicative of a female uh, skull and head. Um, everything's there, but the ears, the inner ear is still there. This came from the state of an ear doctor. I guess everyone knows what the outer ear looks like, but it has like the station tubes and the cochlea and all that good stuff. And um, yeah, everything but the brain is in there. Uh, has little hooks. You could, uh, could open that up. If you want to see the inside of the like a candy jar. 
Yeah, yeah. And then it still has like the eyes and the tongue and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I had an almost identical preparation a number of years ago um, that was actually um, cut down the center and on the side. So it opened up showing all the um, interior um, pieces of the of the head. You know, it has everything. You know, again, you see the tongue, the, the nasal parts, the sinuses, the eyes, um, the gizzard. You know, everything <laughs> was in there. Uh, but that's kind of a neat piece. And um, yeah. <laughs> could be like a viking and drink wine out of it i know people who've made uh chalices and, and yes. drinking vessels out of skulls yeah yep. uh is right. that something you'd like to get into oh absolutely maybe the new studio no <laughs> no because it'll happen i don't want that <laughs> last time i was in texas a friend of mine who has a um mezcal Ria, a bar down there i actually i drank this i'm not sure what kind of spirit it was but it's out of mexico but we drank it out of the skull yeah it was you know it was interesting Hell yeah. As long as it's new and it's clean. clean. Yeah. Get them the old weird stuff. I'm not drinking out of that lady. It's going to be. That lady looks that's like That's how she's we open naughty, up to the new studio. Naughty lady. Is uh, we drink from uh, the skulls of women. <laughs> what do we got next? The shoe? Uh, the shoe. So uh, This was a cool story. Yes, yeah, so this shoe. It's um, it's a real shoe. You'll see it does have wear. Someone did wear this thing. And I bought this in... Actually, I bought this in Texas a number of years ago. And when I bought it, they didn't know anything about it, really. Um, it's... It's it's a real shoe. They did make like uh, shoe companies would make giant shoes for display, but being that this has wear on it, it clearly was worn, so it wasn't just a display. And um, someone had posted online another really huge shoe, and they claimed it was um, Robert Wadlow. He's the world's tallest man. He was in the Guinness Book. There's a lot of photos of him, and um, everyone with a giant shoe claims it's a Wadlow shoe. It's uh, just one of those things. And so I commented, I said, look, every shoe cannot be a Wadlow shoe. I mean, the guy, you know, wasn't an octopus. I mean, he only, you know, how many feet did he have? And um, and the guy's like, well, you know, and I said, well, here's a big shoe. It's it's not gigantic. It's big. It's not like, you know, like a clown shoe. And, um, and so I said, you know, it could have been another sideshow giant. It could have just been a tall person. Some of them were just, you know, giant shoes made for display. And uh, so a friend of mine was like, oh, dude, you have a Wadlow. And I'm like, dude, it's not a Wadlow. Here's the story. And I explained it. And like a day or two later, another friend of mine contacts me. He's like, dude, I heard you have a Wadlow shoe. And I'm like, okay, what, what, the, what the hell's going on here? Explain the whole thing again. And then finally, another very high-end collector friend of mine says, dude, you have a Wadlow. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I show him the shoe. And he, measured, he said, okay, is it 17 and a half inches wide? Is it, he knew all the measurements. He asked about the wear. He said, oh, that's from his leg brace. He's like, dude this is actually a Wadlow shoe and I have the other one. <laughs> so I'm like, what? So this is the, uh, this is the left shoe. He has the right one of this, the same design, same everything. And he's like, well, how much do you want for it? I'm like, I can't sell this. This is a Wadlow shoe, man. I, I can't <laughs> you just it. told me what it is. <laughs> and, um, this guy actually has a few pairs of it, but he has like Wadlow's, um, medical records. They measure, like they did measures of, well, almost uh, everything, everything, but, uh, one thing they didn't measure on him. And, uh, but he has all his information. He's like, that was legit his shoe. Um, I think he was from Oklahoma and I bought this in Texas, but again, they had no, they had no, thought they had a giant shoe, a giant shoe. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I've seen other giants shoes and stuff like that. Um, years ago, I think it was like Sandy Allen's shoe. I know a guy, actually a guy with the, the other Wadlow has a pair of Sandy Allen's shoes as well. So it's gotta be so interesting for you to know all these different people that just have the similar, you know, hunting and finding things. And then you guys share things with each other. It's and a that, small and world. Then to have somebody who actually has the other pair of shoe, like, I don't know, that was probably a really fun conversation. Oh, it was, it was quite neat. Um, that's the thing. In this, in what I do, there's a lot of people, but there's a, a core of people, yeah. and we all either know or know of each other. And um, you know, there's with any community, you're gonna have some really good people, you're gonna have some real dicks, and you're gonna have everything in between. And everyone kind of understands, like, oh yeah, that guy, uh, but this guy's okay. And so you know, as you become friends with people, and as you network, and as you you know become, you know, I, I have a pretty good reputation in this business, and you know. It, it's like I said, people, everyone kind of knows who, you know, who to trust and who not to and all that good stuff. And like I said, I have a lot of really good contacts, been doing this for decades. So I, I have a lot of um, resources and contacts and people I could speak to. I'm like, you know, what is this? Like the, the guy with the, the actual shoe was like, oh, yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, I've been I know that guy for like 25 years. So it, it kind of works out nicely. What's the other foot? One thing. You oh, have uh, another. This was interesting as well. Yeah, this is actually a. um 
it's a form to make a shoe. So, um, you know, back. Hold it up just a little bit higher. Yeah, you're all right. Yeah, so this good. is it's actually a shoe form for someone with a deformed foot, like a club foot. Um, it would have to be a totally custom made shoe. It does separate, so you could take it out of the uh, form. But this is someone with a very deformed shoe or foot, and they would have made this from his foot or her foot, and um, and they would use this again to form the shoe specifically for that person. Um, I've had to have a few other ones. I had a really little one, and I've had other club foot shoes. You don't see it so much anymore now. Of course, they have all sorts of you know procedures to correct feet and and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's it's just kind of a, an unusual uh, deformed. I mean, that's the bottom of the foot, which is pretty cool. Yeah, just a, 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 again a, an unusual object. And uh, what else? Oh, the last piece I brought is actually a photograph. I don't know if I can get that without the glare. We'll see. I just picked this up uh, over the weekend. Um, this is turn of the century ish. And it's a. Uh, can you see that? Or? Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, you can see it really it's, well. It's uh, medical students with their cadaver. Uh, this was sort of like a tradition. They would take photos with their cadavers while, you know, dissecting them. Uh, nowadays, they don't do that. That's frowned upon. It's uh, considered kind of unethical. But uh, this one, you'll see, it's actually a, a co ed class, and they're sitting there cutting up these bodies. Um, there's different, I've, there's, you'll see them sometimes with dates and schools. They also did like novelty ones where they would have like a live person on the table and they'd prop up these cadavers as if they were dissecting the student. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a medical school tradition, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I just picked that one up and, uh, put that on my Instagram. Where'd you find that? Uh, upstate New York, actually. Um, I get around a lot. I mean, I go to a lot of auctions and estate sales and antique shows and, uh, now that it's getting warmer out, a lot of the outdoor shows are kind of starting to open up. Some some are, some are not as well. But I try to cover a fair amount of ground. Now that I don't have a, a you know brick and mortar, I'm able yeah. to do more time. Gives you a lot more freedom. Are you also setting up at any of these shows? Are you doing that or kind of just waiting for your... Um, when you do your own thing to kind of set up shop at I've done both there's a market that I go to um, on Sundays out uh, in, uh, near um, Adamstown, Pennsylvania I've set up there a few times maybe uh, when it was warmer out maybe once a month or so yeah. and just try to bring a different bunch of you know things a different lot and um, so I'll you know I'll, I'll do that too occasionally I'll set up at, at shows here and there what's it like having the complete freedom to just do whatever you want with this stuff it's kind of neat actually yeah you know, that's the thing like I, I have more you know i mean i still have to be up early so, some days and other days i don't and you know i, I put stuff online but it's still uh, you know um i'm just trying to relate on a level of like uh be, like waking up and what you have to do for the day is something you're completely passionate about right. but some days it's like man you know it turns into a job but then there's other mm -hmm. days where it's like you know you're driving somewhere and you're like holy shit like my job is to get yeah, up and do this <laughs> it's kind of neat i mean there's definitely i try to have somewhat of a schedule like i got since i do a lot of you have stuff to. online well <laughs> yeah it'll fall apart <laughs> so like i'm at the post office a lot and yeah. then like i have to get boxes and i found um there's a there's a place near me that i gets deliveries on tuesday so i know if i go there i could take their boxes yeah. so i'm like oh it's free boxes i'll do that since they, that gets did, expensive did you see and, this turning into what it is from the the moment you kind of step foot in that oddity shop and kind of never started doing it and i mean the times in new york were probably sounds like i mean the times that you have now it sounds seems like it's very freeing and you kind of come and go as you please and you're kind of in control of whatever you want but i feel like that time you told me what well, you were telling us about where you're in new york and there's parties and there isn't any social media and it was like you know a hip thing to do in new york it's not easy to become a hip thing in new york i mean how like was that your favorite time or yeah, that was amazing. I mean, that was really just like another, you know, it's almost like, did that really happen? Yeah, you know, it was yeah, like one yeah. of these fever dreams, sort of like, wait, I think that I mean, it was it was a magical time. Again, you know, old New York, well, old New York, but, you know, it was it was it was a different everything. You know, it, it's amazing. And like, I don't know how it could ever be like that again. But, yeah. you know, being there and experiencing that stuff and even like. You know, like I grew up in, in Long Island, and so I used to go to New York City as a, you know, in a, I graduated high school in '86. So, like in the mid '80s, early '80s, I'd go to the city, you know, go to see shows, go down to CBs to see, you know, 
whatever band was coming through town and, you know, just going out and doing that stuff. And back then it was pretty sketchy and it, but it was amazing. It was like a magical time in New York. It was really, you know, it was filthy and dirty and dangerous, but it was exciting and it was alive and it was, you know, just the most, everything was just incredible back then. And, um, so yeah, it was kind of a nice foundation for, for this kind of stuff. And, you know, like when it got to the point where I was working at photo places, you know, nine to five or so, and I'd be staring at the window at work being like, what am I sitting here for, man? Yeah. This, is, this sucks. And yeah. like, how can I do something that I'll enjoy? And again, you know, again, it is work. I mean, it's not all fun and games. And no. you know, it, there's, it's the kind of thing when you're self-employed like this, you know, if you don't work, you're not making money, you know, and, and there's stuff you have to do and you have to motivate yourself. Like, oh, I don't feel like this, but I have to do this. I need to take care of that. Uh, it's a, it's more complicated, but it's at least it's enjoyable. And there's, you know, I'll be at a, flea market middle of the week out in some field walking around looking at old stuff i'm thinking like i'm so glad i'm not at my nine to five right yeah. now you know it's again and it's it, always those moments that continue because I, I think not enough people realize and i know jesse's worked for himself but like you have to motivate yourself to work on a daily basis like oh, i absolutely. have to force myself to edit and do all these things that are like the work steps yeah. in it like this is fun you know what i mean like right. to be able to do this and you come down here and then even have her come down like you know like this this is awesome but then there's stuff behind the scenes right. that i have to like talk myself into doing on a daily <laughs> basis and that's like exhausting as long as the reward is worth it yeah the, as long as the reward is much bigger and better than all that crap you gotta do yep. it, that that's and, and it is it's it's always always 10 times that but i mean right. it's those moments where you know and, and like that's what it is for me doing the podcast where i meet somebody like you and i'm like no like it's totally worth the grind it's totally worth you yeah. doing the actual work because it's not you know there's work to get to it but the payoff of and the freedom of you know those right. moments where you're walking around like how the fuck did I get here? I was yeah. a photographer <laughs> and I was a part of this. And, yeah. and, you know, now it's to the point where I'm running my own festivals and, you know, it's pretty uh, remarkable what you have done, completely driven by passion. And I consider myself lucky in that regard. Again, you know, there's a lot of people I know who are just like, you know, on that, on the, on the rat race, on the, on the yeah. wheel. And they're like, oh, how do I get off this thing? Yeah. And some people can, and a lot of people do. And, and luckily again, now you're saying like with, with the technology, with the internet, with kind of stuff, more people can, you yeah. know, it, it's easier now to, to be able to find like an alternative source of income and yeah. ways to make money and a side hustle where people are like making things and selling things. And, and I, I like that you pointed that out, that more people can come off the wheel because I think it takes a specific person to start thinking outside the box. And I remember like cooking cheesesteaks and working places and I would just be sitting there and be like, man, like I know people are doing things that they love for a living. Why can't I be one of those people? Yeah. And then you start thinking like, all right, well, how do I do that? And then like, it takes a very specific person to yeah. to just really get away from like, you know, well, it's scary. the nipple. <laughs> yeah. And then you know what I mean. And then like, and then you go over here, and it's scary. And I know a bunch of people that would have just jumped back. But I mean, you know, it's very well pointed out where you said like, I I like that it's easier now where people have oh, different absolutely. opportunities to, you know, there's there's you know there's someone listening to this right now looking out a window being like, man, I wish. That's yeah. what I did was go talk to people for a living and be yeah. on a podcast and they just hate their job and they're yeah. miserable. And then I was just, I was tired of feeling that way. I mean, I know people with like big jobs who have quit their job, like people working in law or, you know, legal stuff or, or finance and being like, yeah, I'm making money, but I hate this. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. There's something, I know a lot of people who hate their fucking job. And that's the thing. Like, More than, than like it. And even like what I sell, you know, it's not. A necessity. It's not food or shelter or clothing or, you know, you could survive without any of any, the stuff I sell. Yeah. But it makes people happy and it's stuff that people enjoy. And, and which is, you know, that I think is a necessity in life too, happiness and then and, and, and to enjoy stuff. You know, you could, you could live in a square box and eat gray gruel and, and live a very long life, but to enjoy what you do and to have things that make you happy and that make all the crap worthwhile and stuff that, I mean, that's finding that balance is, is, is important. And, you know, I, like I said, I consider myself fortunate that I've got to the point where I can do that, you know, and, and I've made a business out of buying and selling weird shit. So it's a, uh, there's uh, no better way to wrap the show up than that. Um, I mean, it was very well put because I know what where I'm at and the amount of work it takes to get to doing what you want to do for a living. So, I mean, I know you brush this all off as um, that, you know, it's not something that 
you know, like you act like the TV show and all this was just stuff that you did. But in all actuality, it's like that was all hard work. You know what I mean? A like lot that, of work. It was a lot of work. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much work goes into doing that. And the fact that you took it to this point and now you have this creative freedom. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. It's one of the reasons why I enjoy telling these stories. And I, you know, there's so much to do here that, I, you know, I would love to bring you on monthly. And then, you know, I just just seeing his reaction to this weird stuff is like my favorite <laughs> thing because he's like well who's coming on i'm like this guy's got people's heads and oddities Not weirder. Weirder yeah stuff too. and that's what i want to get into but like you know when i see stuff where first of all you're a home run on the show because you've done television so you know thank you but like there's so much to do here i want to do a halloween episode we've always talked about it but you know and but we never had where the show's at now, we have the the capabilities of doing some really cool stuff. And having you a part of the show, Thank if you, you would want to come on monthly, would be one of my favorite things to do. This is oh, like, sure. this is awesome. Um, Thank you. I want to give everybody the opportunity to find out where they can get your stuff, where they can find out where to buy this stuff. I mean, I know the Instagram, but like what else are anything you want to promote right now? I want to give you the opportunity. Sure. Um, also, I have a website, shopobscuraantiques.com. There's not a ton on there, but I'm adding more to it all the time uh, on Instagram, Obscura Antiques. Uh, on Facebook under my name, Mike Zone, M-I-K-E-Z-O-H-N, I post on there as well. Um, that's the main places I'm selling these days. Um, and again, also the uh, theoddiesmarket.com is the um, website for my events. Right now we're on hold, but we will start up again. I'm looking at hopefully later in the year. Um, also the oddities market on Instagram and Facebook. Um, also on Facebook, uh, Obscura Antiques on, on Facebook also will have that information. Um, when, as soon as you get back in the first event you do, I either want to come down with camera people and film a bunch of stuff, or I want to sell smash burgers there. That works. I want to work together on that <laughs> as well. Uh, your first time listener, first time follower. If this is the first time you're seeing never again, go to never again, studio.com. It has everything you need there that has our apparel, our YouTube, our audio, everything we do to help out small businesses. You can find out everything on never again, studio.com. Uh, thank you again for coming on. I'll thank talk you. to you more after the show. Do you have a quote ready? to end the show i do yes all right his new thing is we're ending with matthew mcconaughey quotes yeah it's, he's it's, a prophet pretty yeah. much yep he the only reason we're doing this is because he bought a lincoln car yeah oh. and the book <laughs> and the thing which all started from him buying a lincoln yes <laughs> it, it, it all goes together <laughs> the first step that leads to your identity in life is usually not i know who i am but rather i know who i'm not it's a process of elimination Matthew McConaughey. It's pretty serious stuff. It is. And I don't know how to close after those, and we'll figure it out. But, I mean, do we fade to black after that, or do we say a thank you to you for the quote? Like, how do we end that then? Amen, maybe? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> like a prayer almost. Maybe. Very. He's, very, very, he's very related. I don't know. I'm not religious. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm saying is after you finish those, do we fade, fade to black? black? You know what I want? Because I, I never know, you know how to end the show. I'll tell you exactly how to end the show. The, uh, the 80s pixelated little squares and pew. That I can thing. I can do that. And, yeah, but oh, I'm yeah. saying is like I never know how to end the show correctly. Even I, I now I'm that. dragging the show out. Freeze frame. I'll just yes. do, yeah. yeah, that would be <laughs> yeah. good too. The freeze <laughs> like so. But I'm saying is you have to end it and then maybe like do like a bow, like you know, like a I bid well, you I, I, bid, I bid you a do is what I thought. You shouldn't cut to someone else. This is your closer, man. I think if you had the audio of him saying these things, it'd work much better. I don't think I think they're all live stuff. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I'm going to stop the show. Freeze frame. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. We still can't end the show. Yeah, no. I believe it's